Hello, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review on cerebral spinal fluid testing. All right, so let's first quickly review some spinal fluid physiology. So spinal fluid is the fluid that surrounds the brain in the spinal cord. Um, it flows between the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater. The three functions of cerebral spinal fluid are the physical support and protection of the brain and spinal cord, the provision of controlled chemical environment to supply the nutrients to the tissues and the removal of waste, and uh, an intracerebral and extracerebral transport system for the brain and spinal cord. The total CSO volume is about 150 mils, which is 8% of the CNS cavity volume, obviously with the bulk of that cavity being taken up by the brain and spinal cord. It is formed predominantly at the choroid plexus deep within the brain and by the epidermal cell lining the ventricle. It is formed at an average rate of 0.4 mils per minute or 500 milliliters per day. And the formation results from selective ultrafiltration of plasma and active secretion by the epithelial membranes. So why would we want to test spinal fluid? It's usually uh, investigated for cases of suspected central nervous system infection, such as uh, meningitis would be a good one, um, a demyelinating disease, multiple sclerosis would be a good example there, a malignancy such as maybe a brain tumor, and hemorrhage or a bleed, uh, like a brain bleed in the central nervous system. To do to collect spinal fluid, we do a lumbar puncture between L3 and L4 vertebrae. When the puncture is done, the CSF pressure is measured. Four tubes are collected, more on that later, and it must be delivered immediately to the lab so that testing can begin without delay. Normal spinal fluid is clear, colorless, free of clots, and free of red blood cells, so it should look like clear water. Um, the two most common reasons for blood and hemoglobin pigments to be found in spinal fluid are the traumatic tap and the arachnoid uh, hemorrhage or a brain bleed, if you will, or some kind of bleed, spinal cord bleed or something. To differentiate between a traumatic tap from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the first method is simply looking at the amount of blood between all the collected tubes. So you have tubes one, two, three, and four one being the first collected, fourth being the last collected. If it's a traumatic tap, there will be more blood in tube one and then less in two, and then hopefully none in three and four. Um, if it is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you would expect about an equal amount of blood in all four tubes. So let's talk about these numbers, one, two, three, and four, um, that are on the tubes. So um, the tubes that are used for spinal fluid aspiration are generally pre-numbered. The numbers are etched. Uh, on the tube um, 1 through 3 or 1 through 4, with tube 1 obviously being the first one filled, and then tube 2, then tube 3, then tube 4. If possible, tube 1 should be reserved for non-routine studies, so things that might need to be sent out to the reference lab. Tube 2 can be used for immunology and chemistry testing. Tube 3 can be used for microbiology testing. And the hematology analysis is typically performed on the, on the last tube collected, which should be three or four, to assure that you don't have contamination from peripheral blood from the uh, lumbar puncture. Um, but if only three tubes are obtained, which like could be the case in a hard to collect sample or maybe a pediatric sample, then tube two is often reserved for microbiology and tube three is shared with hematology lab testing uh, happening first and then followed by any kind of chemistry or immunology testing with what's left. And by the way, also on the orders of uh, what who gets what, obviously abide by your own laboratory's guidelines. For uh, the tests that are done, we're going to talk about the clinical chemistry test um, because this is clinical chemistry re review. So glucose, protein are uh, often done on spinal fluid. You can also do lactate and glutamine levels. Um, glucose enters the spinal fluid predominantly via facilitative transport. Um, so this is co as compared to a passive, which would be diffusion or active transport which is energy dependent. So to have facilitated transports which usually is basically diffusion through through a transport channel. Um, if you so that's how glucose enters the spinal fluid. Usually uh, the difference between um, a serum glucose and a CSF glucose is the spinal fluid glucose tends to be about two-thirds of the level of the blood and that should be that's normal. 
but if you see decreased CSF glucose cross levels below the normal reference range or below what would be expected for the serum glucose level, then it could be the result of three, one of three things. It's either there's a disorder in that carrier-mediated transport of the glucose into the spinal fluid, so it's not crossing over from the plasma into the spinal fluid, or there's active metabolism that glucose by cells or organisms. Um, so organisms could be bacteria or fungi, um, cells could be tumor cells, or there's increased metabolism by the central nervous system, so the brain's just burning more of the glucose. Um, the consumption of that glucose is usually accompanied by an increased lactate level due to the anaerobic glycolysis by the microorganisms or the cerebral tissues. So that's one way to get a clue of what's going on here. So uh, if you look at protein levels in spinal fluid, um, they reflect that selective ultrafiltration of the CSF blood-brain barrier, meaning that not a lot of proteins cross over. So the total protein is only about 0.5% to 1% of that of, of plasma, but the specific protein concentration in spinal fluids are not proportional to what is in plasma levels because, again, of that specificity of that ultrafiltration, only allowing some things through. If you see decreased levels of the CSF total protein, uh, you can suspect maybe, um, so decreased dialysis from plasma, so there's less of it crossing over from the plasma, and increased protein loss, so um, for example, from the removal of excessive volumes of spinal fluid, or leakage from a tear in the dura, also CSF autorrhea, so le leaking it out of the ears, or CSF rhinorrhea, leaking the spinal fluid out of the nose. Um, so um, an increased CSF protein level or um, clinical suspicion usually indicates the need for um, electrophoretic separation. So uh, if you have high levels of uh, protein in the spinal fluid, then it means there's, there's something going on and you want to proceed with an electrophoresis. So if you do an electrophoresis and you see oligoclonal, oligoclonal bands, which is a small number of clones of IgG from the same cell type within nearly identical electrophoretic properties from the same area. So this, uh, uh, we have this, here's an albumin and you have oligoclonal bands. Uh, so they're, um, in the same area of this uh, spinal fluid, sorry, um, that is usually associated with uh, inflammatory diseases and uh, multiple sclerosis um, or SSPE. And so you're basically you're looking, what is indicating is IgG production in the spinal fluid. Another protein thought to be specific for MS is the myelin basic protein, and that can also be tested for on spinal fluid. Um, so uh, lactate and glutamine are the other, the last two tests. So lactate is a useful indicator of anaerobic metabolism within the spinal fluid. Um, increased lactate levels with a normal to decreased glucose level has been suggested as a readily accessible indicator of bacterial meningitis. Glutamine is formed by the combination of ammonia and glutamate. The synthesis of glutamine is a means to reduce ammonia levels within the CNS. Uh, glutamate elevations are frequently seen in patients that have hepatic encephalopathy, along with various other pathologies with uh, obviously accumulation of ammonia in the blood instead. So, and that is the last form of spinal fluid testing. Thank you.